for having him preach. We just uh, uh, know that you'll be with them, guide them, and be with us. Open our hearts and minds to hear and gain something from it, Father, that would help us to live a life that would glorify you more. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Wayne. Good morning, church. I uh, told you last week, uh, after I preached, uh, I said, well, well, Todd will be here this week, but uh, I guess I lied. Um, <laughs> Todd had planned on being here, but uh, he, um, they had to go back out to Oklahoma since uh, uh, Jana's uh, dad or their parents' house sold, so they need to go out and take care of that. So, um, so Todd will be here next week, <laughs> we think, <laughs> but uh, I was, he called me last Sunday. And I, it, this past week was really busy for us and our family. Family coming in, uh, we had a retirement ceremony to prepare for, a wedding ceremony to prepare for, uh, all of these things. And I said, whew, I am glad I do not have to preach next Sunday. <laughs> and, and Todd sends me a text. And I had, uh, many years ago, Many years ago, I, I, I made myself a promise. If I'm ever asked to preach, I wouldn't turn it down. And uh, I said, yeah, I'll do it. And, um, and I was working on my lesson. Um, and then Dub died. My lesson changed some. Because, you know, today there are heavy hearts here today. Uh, when, when death comes, we, we like, uh, I mean, we're Christians. And when a Christian dies... We're, we're happy knowing where they are, but I tell you what, it still hurts here, and, and there's no hiding that, um, and, and, and this is a difficult time for the Stern family and so many of us. Uh, I, I didn't know, Dub, as well as so many of you did. We've only been attending here about a year and a half now, and, uh, and, and yet it's still a, a blow to all of us um, in this, but yet we're to be joyful for Dub. Boy, that's difficult, uh, thinking of ourselves and the hurt here. So um, yeah, I encourage us all to be here today, if, if at all possible, for, for, um, at 2 o'clock for the ceremony. Today, and like I said, I, I changed things up a little bit on my lesson this year has, has been an unusual year, uh, to say the least, right? Uh, and, and, and we've all had things that have impacted us as a whole, such as a virus. And then we've had individual things that have impacted us um, in our own lives. And we just look at it, and finally we say, well, this is 2020. What do you expect? You know? And these little things that, that, that happen. And then, I mean, and, and we're continuing with, with the passing of Dub. Um, all, all of these little things uh, throughout the year and, and some big things. And, and, and oh, by the way, we got a presidential election. Let's don't even go into that. I don't want to get your anger up. Uh, depending on which side I talk about. So we have all of these things, this mixture of things going on and, and adversity. Um, and today, uh, I just want us to look a little bit at the scriptures. Um, and, and talk about that a little bit. A lot of you remember the old TV show, The Honeymooners. Now, that show was actually before my time. It was way before my time. And, I mean, it's like the other day somebody asked me, because, I mean, I came in the Air Force in 84, they, but anyway, somebody asked me if I was in Vietnam. I, no. No, I was in fifth grade when that ended. Thank you. And I, I didn't make uh, the Korean War or World War II either. Um, young folks nowadays, but anyhow, um, so the Honeymooners was uh, long before my time, but then all of a sudden they showed back up, and I watched a few episodes of it, and um, you might remember uh, um, uh, Ed uh, Norton, the friend, uh, the neighbor of uh, uh, Jackie Gleason there, uh, kind of a happy-go-lucky, kind of slow-thinking worker in the sewer systems of the city. And uh, he once summed up his philosophy of life in these words. He said, when the tides of life turn against you and the current upsets your boat, 
Don't waste tears on what might have been. Just lie on your back and float. <laughs> so, you know, this morning I want to talk about somebody who repeatedly saw the tides of life turn against him, whose boat was upset many, many times, whose difficulties would have crippled the faith of, of, of a weaker person, but, but he didn't sink. He, did, he didn't even float. He rose above the tides of adversity. He overcame his difficulties because his philosophy of life was nobler and more wise uh, than Ed Norton's. His name was Joseph. It's rather amazing that Joseph, the son of Jacob, ever amounted to anything. His father, Jacob, had two wives, two concubines. He fathered 12 sons, had an unknown number of daughters. Joseph had 10 older half-brothers and one full brother younger than, than, than he was. You know, his mother, Rachel, was Jacob's favorite wife. Remember that? Uh, she died uh, giving birth to uh, his younger brother, Benjamin. Um, because Joseph was Rachel's first child, had been born in Jacob's old age, it was obvious to his ten older uh, brothers that Joseph was daddy's favorite. Daddy's favorite. Now, I, I guess most everyone in your families, if you have siblings, you kind of joke back and forth, well, you're the favorite. No, you're the favorite. You're, you're daddy's favorite, your mama's favorite. Rhonda's siblings sometimes call her the golden child. Uh, joking back and forth, you know. Um, my brother and sister, I'm the youngest, will give me a hard time that I am kind of the golden child. And, and I tell them, because my sister's like nine years older than me, my brother's seven years older than me, I said, look, by the time I came along, my, my, y'all wore, I said, you two wore out mom and daddy. I said, they were tired. And so they gave me what I wanted. Plus, y'all were gone, they had more money. Am I right? You know that's right. Yes. And so I deserved it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the favoritism here and, and that you're all well aware of in this story, it, it was very obvious in their eyes. And then Jacob gave Joseph a very fancy coat of many colors. Remember that. You know... His half-brothers were absolutely hostile to Joseph because of all of this. We read in Genesis uh, chapter 37, verse 4, And his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, so they hated him and, and, and could not speak to him on friendly terms. You know, not only was Joseph his father's favorite son, but he's rather a naive 17-year-old teenager naive and not realizing how much his half-brothers hated him. Because, see, he had these dreams. Remember these dreams? What did he do? He went and told them. Think about that, would you? I mean, he, he is the golden child. He has these dreams, and they aren't just regular old dreams. I had a dream the other night, the night before my retirement ceremony. It was a crazy, wild dream. <laughs> I told Rhonda about it. She said, well, I had a dream too. And we told our dreams. And thanks be to God, neither one of them came true. Um, and y'all wondering, what were y'all's dreams then? But it doesn't matter. <laughs> Joseph said, I am going to tell my dreams. Genesis 37, verse 7 and 8. He told his half-brothers, we were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. Come on now. That, that, come on, man. His brother said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then in verse 9... He goes on, because he done told him one dream, but he feels like, I had another dream. Let me tell you about this one here, too. And he says, I had another dream. This time, the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. If you ever have dreams like that, don't tell your siblings. <laughs> so the hostility here was pretty evident that even, even his father Jacob felt it was necessary at this point to rebuke him. Say, come on, man, you know, settle down. Settle down. 
If you've studied the life of Joseph, um, you also know that his dreams were prophetic. They came from God, they, they show what God planned to do in Joseph's life, but the fact that Joseph thought his brothers would be excited about these dreams shows us just how sheltered and naive Joseph really was. The rest of the story, very familiar to all of us, the older brothers were tending their father's flock some distance away from home. Jacob hadn't heard from them in a while, so he sends Joseph, says, Joseph, go check on them. Joseph says, all right, Dad, I will go check. Let me put on my coat, though, of all these colors, because I'm going to see my brothers. Yeah. <laughs> well, they see him coming, they see that coat of many colors, and they're not too happy about that. Uh, and they, and they, they decided, let's plot against him. Most of the brothers wanted to kill him. But Reuben, the oldest brother, suggested, well, instead of killing him, Let's throw them into a deep cistern and just leave them there to die. That way they wouldn't be guilty of shedding his blood. Y'all remember this story? Well, verse 22 says that Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So Reuben's a good guy here. When Joseph got to their camp, they seized him, stripped off his coat, threw him into a cistern. But as they were eating, they saw a slave caravan passing by on the way to Egypt. Uh, and they had a bright idea. They said, hey... Um, uh, let, let, let's sell him to these people. We'll save ourselves from the guilt of murder and we'll even make a little money on the side. And in verse 28 tells us that they pulled Joseph up out of the cistern. They sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who then took him to Egypt. How quickly things can go wrong. Think about this now. Joseph is a sheltered child. Probably has everything that he wants. Uh, it would suggest, you know, Jacob had some wealth. And, uh, and, and life was really good for, for Joseph up until now. And all of a sudden, his world collapses. You know how your world can collapse, right? Things go wrong. Job loss. Marriage falling apart. A medical diagnosis that you were not expecting or someone passes away. Things that life throws at us. At, at, at one point, you are riding high. Life is so good. Life is so good. And then it starts collapsing. That's Joseph. That's Joseph. He goes to see his brothers, naive, doesn't know what's going on. And all of a sudden, they take him. Maybe they, they, he thinks they're just playing at first. Now he is sold into slavery. This story is relevant today. I want to look at a few things. First one is when things go wrong, you know, we may or we may not be responsible for them. Sometimes we are, sometimes we aren't. In my life, most of the issues, problems, troubles that I have had, I brought them on myself. Not all of them, but many of them. And sometimes, maybe that's the same way with you. Um, you, you know, Joseph, here, here, here in, in one way, he was responsible for his troubles, but another way that he, he, he wasn't. The cause of his trouble was a hatred of his brothers. This hatred that was fanned by a couple of flames there, one was his lack of sensitivity to the feelings of the older brothers, kind of throwing it in their face, look who I am, look at my coat, knowing he's the favorite, or I, I would assume he had to know he was the favorite. And the other one was the unmistakable and unconcealed favoritism of, of his father. Y you know, his dad shouldn't have been doing that, right? Right? I mean, even if you have a favorite child. I have a favorite child. It's not one of my own children, but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I saw that on Facebook the other day. But uh, <laughs> my children are here today, and they're all looking like, well, Dad, I love my children. I love them all equally. But even if I had a favorite one, it's just wrong to shower one with, with, with stuff and show that, 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 that they're favored over the others. I love my children. 
And his dad here apparently was doing things for Joseph that he was not doing for his uh, brothers or even his, his sisters. So sometimes we are responsible for the difficulties that arise. Sometimes it's out of our own choices. A young girl falls in love. She idolizes her sweetheart. She looks past his faults. We sometimes say that love is blind, but it's also sometimes a self-induced blindness. I have done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of, of counseling, premarital counseling, and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and sometimes people come, uh, they want to get married, and they come, and they see me, and, and, and before I'll do a wedding, I, I require premarital counseling, and, and uh, I, I, I sometimes see some red flags that they don't see, because they're all in love, or in lust, I don't know, but whatever it is, I'm like, you know, this doesn't look good, but I don't tell them that directly. But sometimes I'll ask questions, and, and, and I'll ask a young lady, okay, well, you know he does this and this and this, and you don't like that, do you? Oh, no, 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 Chapman, I, you know, I, I don't. But after we're married, I'm going to change him. Whoa. Okay, well, then it's okay then. <laughs> Let's do this wedding. I have heard that so many times. After we're married, I will change her. After we're married, I will change him. Look, if they ain't going to change before the wedding, they ain't changing afterwards. And you do not marry someone with an intent to change them. That wasn't in my notes. I'm just getting preachy now. Now, that does not mean that you don't change. Rhonda has changed me in so many ways for the better. But when we got married, when we originally got married, if she'd have said, I'm going to change you, being the Alabama redneck, and I'm not, I would have said, no, you're not. I would have resisted it at all costs. Well, nobody's changing me. I'm perfect. But she has changed me for the better. So sometimes issues in life, we bring them on ourselves. Sometimes just by the poor choices that we make, right? Before Rhonda and I married, uh, 1984, I bought me a brand new truck. First vehicle I ever had was brand new. I was 19 years old. My daddy tried his best, taught me out of it. I was new in the Air Force. I had money and no sense. And I had to have this 1984 Ford Ranger with buckshot mutters and a gun rack. I was something. I had to have that truck. And I was getting stationed down here in Florida at Eglin. And yeah, um, the bad thing about the truck was it, it didn't have an air conditioner. And, um, and so Rhonda still kids with me about this that to this day. Says, who would buy a truck, move to Florida with no air conditioning, <laughs> even 1984? But uh, you know that was uh, and, and that was my choice. And after I had it, and the new wore off, and I realized that every dime I was making was going to either insurance or a payment on that truck with no air conditioning. I said, you know, this was a mistake. But sometimes you're so upside down in a vehicle like that, you just suffer through it. And we did, and we got married. We went on our honeymoon in that truck. And, uh, and we finally were able to sell it. <laughs> it was a nice truck. But sometimes we make choices that are not the best, and we bring problems on ourselves. Sometimes, though, uh, things happen to us that we're not responsible for. We work hard, and, and, and we have a, a job, a good job. We're saving for our old age, and, and all of a sudden, inflation cuts our savings in half, and... and we lose our job or something goes wrong and, and, and it's wiped away. And we find ourselves having to start all over again. Sometimes life just simply happens. Things that we have no control over whatsoever. Secondly, when things go wrong, we are responsible for the result. You know... Uh, I, 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 I wish we knew what went on Joseph's mind as he's being taken away as a slave down to Egypt. 
He could have reacted very bitterly towards God. He could have said, so this is the way you run things? What have I, what have I done to deserve this? I was trying to do what my father told me. I was out looking for my brothers to report back home. I was doing my duty. And this is the result. God, I am through with you. He could have done that. When things go wrong, many people take that attitude. and They blame God and they quit. I was uh, uh, ministering to a, to a lady one time who uh, very regular attender at church, very involved and everything, and she, her mother was in bad shape, and she prayed, and she prayed, and she prayed, and prayed for her mother's health, and her mother died. She was so bitter, so bitter. She says, I will never go back to church again. I will never worship God again. I prayed to him that my mom would not die, and she died. There must not even be a God. We can be like that sometimes. We don't get our way, then we start blaming. There's others who say, you know, I may not be responsible when things go, go wrong, but I am responsible for what I do about it. So they meet the situation, not with bitterness and all, but with courage and determination. That's what Joseph did, and even as a slave... He soon received honors and responsibilities. Potiphar's wife tried to entice Joseph to sin. But what did he do? He refused. Again, things went wrong. Because of this, he did the right thing. He was lied about by his temptress. He was arrested. He was in prison. While doing what was right the first time, he had been sold into slavery. And now he's been put into prison. Why should he remain faithful to God? You hear him telling himself that in prison? Sitting there in, in, a, in a jail cell saying, why should I, why should I worship God? Why, why, why should I obey God? Why should I follow God? Here I am in jail. But he didn't become bitter. He didn't blame God. Instead, he met his trials with courage and determination. Thirdly, the result can sometimes be better than we ever dreamed possible. First thing was, when things go wrong, we may or may not be responsible. Secondly, we are responsible for what we do about it. And then this third one here, with God's help, the result can be better than we ever dreamed possible. You know, his predicament turned into a tremendous blessing. He ultimately, as you remember from the story, became prime minister of Egypt. His rise to power was directly related to his so-called bad luck. Had he never been sold into slavery, he would never have met Potiphar. Had he never met Potiphar, he would never have been put in prison. Had he never been put in prison, he wouldn't have met Pharaoh's baker. Had he never met Pharaoh's baker, he would never have been asked to interpret Pharaoh's dreams. Had he never interpreted Pharaoh's dreams, he would never have been made prime minister of Egypt. How those things just happen like that. You see, sometimes success is nothing but failure turned inside out. Life happens. You've heard the story, if life gives you lemons, make lemonade. One of George McDonald's books, he tells of a woman who experienced great sudden sorrow. She said, I wish I'd never been made. Her friend quietly replies, my dear, you're not made yet. You're only being made. This is part of the maker's process. What happens to us never, is never the most important thing. The most important thing is how we react. Joseph teaches us even the worst difficulties can produce great results. But the story doesn't end there with Joseph becoming prime minister. He was elevated to that high position. He was able to save not only the people of Egypt, but also his brothers, their families, and his elderly father as well. The famine in Palestine drove his family to Egypt in search of food. Joseph, through his influence, provided homes and land for them. You know, when things go wrong, we often have a chance to not only help ourselves, but to render a service to others. Lastly, when things go wrong, God is always standing by to help. Always. Our courage, our determination can feed on the assurance that God is our friend and is always there with us.
no matter what. Where is God during this pandemic? Well, he's in the same place he's always been. He hasn't moved. Where is he today as, as, as we remember Dub? He's in the same place. God's embracing us. God knows our hurts. Story goes on. Joseph brought his family to live in Egypt. The brothers who sold him into slavery were now completely in his power. Finally, their father Jacob dies, and after his death, the brothers are so afraid, they, 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 they fear the worst that, that they uh, go and throw themselves before Joseph and beg his forgiveness. And then Joseph answers, Genesis 50, 20, our, our, reading, our text uh, reading today, Do not be afraid. You intended to harm me, but God... It's always good after... You read, but God, in the Bible. But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Church, today, today is a, a difficult uh, day. You know, there's something about as Christians and, and you, you attend worship with your brothers and sisters and all, the first time back in church after the death of a loved one or a close friend or family member, in our case, an elder, it's, it's, it's different. Even though Dub had not been able to be with us for a while, we knew where he was. In church, even today, we know where he is. And we wish he could be here with us today. And it's hard coming back to church. For some reason, I, maybe it's just me feeling this, but it's always after the death of someone like that, your first time back in church is a little more difficult. So we're going to end with this. We're going to have an invitation song. Life is difficult. Life can be very difficult. This has been a difficult year. Um, and, and, and I encourage all of us, no matter what adversity comes your way, no matter what happens, trust God. Trust God. Keep leaning on God. Don't give up on God. He hasn't given up on us. Follow God. Do His will. He's going to wrap his arms around you. He's going to take care of you. He's going to deliver you. Just like he delivered Joseph, he's going to deliver all of us as well. Church, today, if you have need of our invitation, if you need prayers of the church, if you need to put on the Lord in baptism, no matter what it is, we invite you to come right now while together we stand and sing. Will you come?